Anything that is true for you always makes you feel lighter. A lie always makes you feel heavier. And so anything that feels like that energy of lightness that you just asked for, do it. Even if it's a cup of coffee with somebody or going on a trip or starting a relationship or starting a job, whatever it happens to be, that's a way of having something to follow that will lead you to what you're asking for. It's a way of knowing what to choose. And if you start choosing the things in your life that make you light, the sum total of your life will start getting a lot lighter. And lighter is when you're happier. Lighter is when you're more creative. Lighter is when you're actually creating things that are beyond your mind and beyond the right and wrong judgment system that we've learned to live with. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Dane, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, very grateful to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so I found out about you by way of your publicist, and uh, I was immediately intrigued actually by one line in your bio that kind of got me to say yes. So on that note, I want to start by what I think is a very relevant question, given the thing that caught my attention. That is, where in the world did you grow up and what impacted where you grew up end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Well, my early childhood up until just uh, before becoming a teenager was spent in the ghetto. and. Uh, in this really poor area of Los Angeles. And uh, very interesting because it was it was the only place my mom could find that she could afford. She had very little money at the time. And, um, you know, and I also had this family on the other side that had plenty of money, but wouldn't actually support me or her to to find a different place to live. And so it created a very unique living, learning, growing up situation you know, the joke I used to make was there were three colors where I grew up. There was brown, there was black, and there was me, you know. <laughs> and so it's like being being the only child of non-color, you know, in a situation. It was a very interesting thing because, you know, nobody, none of us kids noticed that I was a different color or that any of the other kids were a different color until about eight years old. And that's when people started, you know, calling derogatory names. That's when I started getting beaten up for being different and that sort of thing. And it's interesting, though, also because, you know, all of my friends were people of color, you know, and I think it's so funny in today's day and age, if I say my friends were Mexican, which they actually were, then somehow if I say that word, then somehow racism gets brought into the, you know, into the spectrum. And I'm like, we live in an insane world right now, you know. Mm -hmm. And so my friends were African-American. My friends were Latin American. Um, and, uh, and yet there were still people who saw me as a different color and wanted to beat me up because of it, which, so I had that going on. And I also, um, lived in a family where my mom was living with her girlfriend and her kids. And so, and one of which is a boy, but the others were women and, and the women hated men. And so, it was free reign to be wrong for being a man. It was free reign to be wrong for, for being of white color. And, um, but it's interesting because, I, you know, you don't look at these things until afterwards. I mean, you have the experiences you have. And for me, one of the things I experienced was, was uh, a lot of abuse. I experienced some dynamic physical abuse in the house from when my mom was not there. I experienced emotional abuse. Uh, and I also experienced this, you know, abuse based on race and getting beaten up for being a different color. And yet my point of view was always, it doesn't have to be this way. Like, mm -hmm. why can't we just get along? Like, I, I never understood it. And even after, you know, after being abused by women, because it was women that were actually sexually abusing me, I didn't look at it and go, wow, I hate women. This is because of women. I looked at it and went, these people are messed up. Like I knew it was the person. And I think, you know, we're living in a world right now where people want to say, if you're this color, you're this kind of person. If you're female, you're this, if you're male, you're this, uh, uh, we're all people and all of us people make different choices. And so at about, I guess, 11, um, my mom and I finally moved out of the ghetto. 
Now, contrast this with every other weekend I was going to live with my grandparents who actually um, were pretty well off, upper middle class, I'd say, at the time. And, um, you know, and so I would go there on the weekends and I would have nice clothes and nice things to eat, nice, you know, nice, happy time. And then I would go back during the week and just dread Sunday evening when I had to go back and live with these people who just hated me. And I think there's 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 so many things in that that a lot of people experience in their daily lives, maybe at that level or maybe at a lesser level where where they've they're living in a world that they don't like living in. And as a little kid, I didn't see any way to get out. And I think, you know, what can we together change to make it so it's different for all of us? Yeah. So, you know, what, what I wonder is <clears throat> you had sort of a front row seat to something that and most of us only witness through media or movies like Boys in the Hood. What do you think that we, uh, me as somebody who has never experienced that and growing up in, a, in an area like that, what misperceptions do you think that uh, and biases do you think I have from just what I've seen and what I've experienced through movies and, and media? Oh, goodness. Uh, where to begin? You know, <laughs> because because for me, what I, uh, the you know, the bias from not having necessarily lived something and, and not having walked a mile in someone else's shoes. It's like, there are so many and they're, they're, they range from small to huge, but I, you know, even the bias that, that, so, so, you know, you'll see in movies, you know, people in, um, impoverished areas and there's all this crime and there's all that stuff. Yes. And at the same time, these people are living their lives. You know, it's like, they know, you know, they've got a drug dealer down the street on the corner or wherever it is, but they don't stop living their life. In other words, from the outside, you'd look and go, whoa, if I moved in here, I'd be terrified and I'd stay in my house trembling all day. That's not what they do. They live their life and they take the best precautions they can. They, uh, you know, as I did when I was living there and my family did. And, you know, you take the best precautions you can and you live your life and you handle what needs to be handled as it comes up. And I think there's a lot of there's a lot of desire to separate from that in a lot of other, you know, if you're not in that situation, there's a desire to even separate from the reality that it exists rather than a desire to engage on the level and with the awareness that, OK, these are people with families also. They are actually living the you know, they're not just living when the cameras are rolling and when this drama situation is going on. and somebody's getting shot or arrested or something, they're living their lives here, doing the best that they can. How can we elevate that level of experience is what I keep going to, you know, how, how can we, how can we acknowledge that we're all living the lives that we are now? What can we do to elevate the level of that for all of us, no matter, no matter what that level is. Hmm, interesting. So, you know, it's also interesting that you noted that you didn't really think about race or color until you were of a certain age. What, like, what prompted you to kind of to notice that? Were there events or experiences that raised your awareness of that? Uh, and I also wondered, you know, as you've gone through, like, particularly in the wake of what we're experiencing now, that was, I think, the big reason that one line in your bio caught my attention. And I told Erica, I said, you know, this is the reason I wanted to talk to you is because. Um, this to me was such an unusual experience. Um, was there any event in particular that you kind of became aware of the fact that, okay, wait a minute, this is, this is different. Uh, yeah, it was when somebody that I thought was a friend walked by with, it was either an older cousin or older brother or something who walked up and said, what are you doing here? Honky? This is where we <laughs> live and punched me in the face. <laughs> wow. I was like, uh, Okay. And I ran home crying and bleeding, you know, and I went to my mom when she got home and I'm like, mom, what's a honky? And, uh, you know, and that was, you know, that was the term back in the day. And uh, what I realized from that is, you know, little kids don't judge when they come in. We're taught to judge and mm -hmm. we're taught to separate and we're taught that people are different and therefore wrong rather than we're all different. Therefore, nobody's wrong. And so and I still here's the thing is I still don't get you know i get it i i get it in other people's worlds but for me the idea that somebody who is a different color is a different person is a non-reality and people say oh well you of course you must have some judgment i'm like 
actually, no, I'm weird. I'm wired differently. I, you know, and maybe that helped me survive without a level of bitterness based on, you know, what I experienced as a child. But the interesting thing also is for me, that and many other interesting experiences that I had growing up, but, you know, for me, it, you know, when somebody says they don't define me, you know, a lot of times they're, they're, they're trying to pretend that they don't, but really for me, it's like, yeah, I experienced that. It gave me a dynamic level of awareness that helps me do what I do and a dynamically different perspective that allows me to see a lot of other people's perspectives. But to say that that defines me, I think it, I think it shaped a lot of awarenesses that I have, but it got over defining me a long time ago, which I'm really grateful for. Hmm. So it's, it's funny to hear you say this because, uh, you know, I was talking about a roommate who <clears throat> happens to also be white and he, I think, you know, was reading, I think, White Fragility or one of the, the books that somehow made it to the, the top of Amazon with everything that's going on. And it was interesting to hear him say that up until this, he, when he read that book, he said, wow, he said, I don't even think about race. He said that, you know, race is almost like water to a fish for a white person in America. And it was fascinating to hear him to say that because, you know, as an Indian person, it's pretty, you know, you're well aware of the fact that you're of a different color and a different race. And I, I think that happens fairly early, especially as an immigrant. Uh, you know, so, so like, I, I wonder, I mean, because our biases are so baked into us. I, I can tell you for a fact that I have biases that come even from growing up in the environment that I did uh, around Indian parents. Like they say things about white people and black people and Chinese people. And you're like, Okay, those are ridiculous statements to make, but you realize those those things are just kind of amusing. They, they come out of our you know our parents' mouths. Like I always said, you want to you know the ultimate litmus test of your Indian parents' racism is to bring home a black girl or a Muslim girl. Then we'll see how open minded they really claim they are. <laughs> you know, uh, so so I wonder you know what you say to that you know when somebody like my roommate says, oh, this is you know race is like water to a fish, especially because you're not like that. Well, that. You know, I I understand that perspective also, you know, and it's like, but what I've looked at and, you know, and having traveled the world and had many conversations with all kinds of people of different colors, different cultures, different, you know, sexual orientations, religion, all that stuff. It's like, it's interesting to notice that there are certain people that where racism seems to be baked into their, the character of their being, you know? And then there are a lot of people where it's just not. And so I keep what I keep going back to is it's about the people. You know, what do the people choose? Like not the people, but the individual. What does the individual choose? Are they are they choosing to be somebody who's embracing or they choose to be somebody who's creating separation and division where you're wrong because you're different or you're right because you're like me, you know, and, and I do get your roommate's point. It's like, you know, it's like water to a fish. And the thing is you're swimming in the water your whole life. You know, one of the things I say when I deliver workshops to people, I'm like, look, there's a lot of stuff that you have been swimming in your whole life that you think is you. It's like, if you've been swimming in carrot soup for 35 years, somebody pulls you out, you look like a carrot, you smell like a carrot, you taste like a carrot, but you're still not a carrot. You've just been swimming in carrot soup. And that's what I see with, with what goes on here, because, you know, we all know kids learn to pick up on the points of view of their parents and their friends. And, you know, as they get to teenagers, their friends become much more of an influence. And so there's, there's the awareness that it's there. And, but what I keep going back to is, okay, so how do we change it? How do we appeal to those people that are doing it and being it but it's not actually the nature that they would choose to do and be to get them to recognize it, to get them to know, hey, you're not wrong for choosing this, but there is a way greater option that'll create the future you would like to create for you and all of us. That's uh-huh. what I would like to, you know, head in the direction of. Uh huh. We'll we'll get to to sort of this idea of creating futures. You mentioned abuse, uh, you know, sort of both physical, emotional. Some of it you've alluded to, and from what it sounded like, it didn't sound like there was a father figure present, correct? That is true. I, well, my parents were separated and I would, uh, the idea was I would spend every other weekend with my dad, you know, based on the custody arrangement, except my dad was off being, uh, you know, a bachelor doing whatever he wanted. So I ended up spending most of those weekends with my grandmother 
in that house that I grew up in, there was not a father figure around at all. In mm-hmm. fact, I <laughs> there was not a male role model in my life. Um, my grandfather was, however, that I'm grateful for. You know, I would see him every few weekends, maybe. But uh, yeah, absolutely not. Um, so I, I wonder what has been the impact on your adult life of not having had a father figure in your uh, early life? Well, it's interesting. Um, you know, I look at some of the things that people have in their lives and and my sense is we choose a lot of those things, even a lot of times when it doesn't look like it. But one of the gifts for me of not having a father figure like my father around was I got to avoid a lot of the racism, the sexism, the bigotry, the the sort of self-centered unkindness that a lot of people perpetrate on the world. Um, and it, from other perspectives, though, what so, you know, when I started dating and for so much of my dating history, I was trying to be the opposite of what men had supposedly been to women. And so I ended up being that guy that is, you know, the one who's like, um, yeah, I really like him. We really have really great sex, but if he could just be more of a man, you know, in other words, if I could just get angry more, if I could just have more of a fixed point of view, if I could just be more forceful, you know? And so I got, I got put in the friend category many times, but then also even in my relationships, you know, my girlfriends would say, can't you just grow a set of balls? And I'm like, um, with the sex we just had, I think, you know, I have balls. What are you asking of me? You need to get angry. I'm like, um, it's not my nature. I'm sorry. I, I can try, you know, but it's always going to be fake. It's like, yeah. I'm a lover, not a fighter. I'm sorry. And, you know, I attribute part of that to growing up primarily with my mom and her level of kindness. Cause she's an extremely kind woman and, um, kind of, you know, brings me to tears to, to think of the kindness that this sweet lady is and has been in my life. You know, she's been my best friend since I was a little kid and she did her best to teach me to grow up, to be a kind person. And when the, when the abuse was going on in, in the house we were living in, in the ghetto, she didn't know it, you know, that was going on when she wasn't there. And then of course the threats, you know, if you tell your mom will, will hurt you both. Um, so I didn't tell her until much later and, um, you should have seen the look on her face. It was like, you know, she turned ghostly white instantly and it was like, and she apologized, I don't know, probably a thousand times. Like, I'm so sorry. I did not know that was going on. I would have gotten you out of there. I'm like, well, mom, you know what? You actually, you did your best. You were a great friend and you always took care of me and looked out for me. So So I think having that, you know, it's like we can say whatever based on male role model, female role model. But once again, I had an amazing person as a role model that that contributed to me greatly. Hmm. So one thing, other thing you alluded to in our conversation is this sort of contrast between seeing poverty and wealth. uh, Basically, by your normal environment on the, the weekdays, surrounded by what effectively is poverty living in the ghetto. And then the weekends, you know, experience the other middle class life. What did that end up doing to shape your own perspective on money and wealth? Interesting. What it did for me is it did two things. One, um, because also my mom's side of the family always struggled with money, you know, um, and that was just their thing. So what it did on the one hand was it created this place where I thought money was really a struggle and that it wasn't easy to come by. And also, though, it, it's weird. It's like I could see both sides of both sides, which was very helpful because the other the gift that it gave me having the other side was the awareness that there were these other possibilities available that I could choose, meaning I wasn't stuck in the poverty mentality. There was something else available that I had experienced. And looking at it, I want uh, I'd rather have the one with money. Thanks. You know. And I remember, you know, I remember driving with my relatives one time with my mom's aunt or uh, my mom's uh, sisters. And we were driving in our little car that was probably, I don't know, 15 years old that, you know, needed a needed just to be thrown away. But we were driving it and this Mercedes convertible passed us up with two people in it looked like they were having a great time. And I went, oh, cool car. 
And all of my aunts looked at me and said, those people with money are not happy. <laughs> and I looked around and I was probably 12 or 13 at the time. I looked around at the people in the car and I was like, they couldn't be any less happy than you people, you know? And it was that moment where I went, you know what? I'm going to try money out because you have no money. You have this superiority, like the idea that money with people aren't happy. I said, but you're no happier. You're less happy than most of the people I know. And so what I always did for some reason was look from all these different perspectives, you know, from the time I was a little kid and, and start to sort of craft what I desired as a future based on what I liked, what I didn't like, but also what seemed to be working with people's points of view and what didn't seem to be working from their, with the points of view that they had. And so I started looking at, okay, what would I like to have? I'm like, okay, so they tell me people with money aren't happy. I'm like, but I know one person with money that's happy, my grandfather. And I know some other people that seem to be happy and they seem to be nice, even though my family says everybody who has money is evil. And I looked at that and I'm like, even as a kid, I was like, how could money make you evil? I think something different is going on here. And so it created a place where what I wanted to do was experience it because it would make my life easier, but also because I saw there were a lot of things that I might be able to, to create that I wanted to create that I couldn't create without money. And one of the things that occurred 20 years ago now was um, my business partner now, the, the guy that founded Access Consciousness, we were we had just met and we were having a conversation. I, I asked him to help me with my money stuff because I was struggling with money for the first 30 years of my life. And he said, so why do you want money? And I went, well, I don't know. I just like, you know, to have things be easier and more fun. He said, well, let me give you a different perspective. He said, the purpose of money is to change people's realities for the greater. And my jaw dropped. And I went, what? And he repeated it. And I went, okay, I'm finally willing to have it. If I can create people's realities as greater with it, then I'm in. And that one conversation started changing my willingness to have money. And so it's been a continuously upward trend since then that allows me, you know, what I've realized is the more resources I have, the more I can contribute to people. And the more things that I can create in the world that to create a different possibility. So I'm grateful for everything that I got. I'm grateful for those perspectives and experiences. And at the same time, you know, looking at the points of view that my family had that wouldn't have money, um, that was one. But also my part of the family that did have money, most of them were unhappy too, except my grandfather. And so I realized putting those two together, it wasn't the money that made you happy or unhappy. It was whether you chose to be happy or unhappy or not. A better night's sleep is one of the best and easiest ways to improve your physical and mental health. And it's a heck of a lot easier than all this nonsense. So even if you throw your New Year's resolutions out the window, you can still put your body on a nectar mattress and get the healthy sleep you need. Prices start at just $499, and you get $399 in accessories thrown in, plus $100 off, a 365-night home trial, and a forever warranty. Go to Nectarsleep.com and join the over 2 million people who are already sleeping on a Nectar mattress this year. Hmm. So I think the, the things, one other thing that's really struck me about um, the way you tell the story, and I, I'm curious if you realize this when you're younger, it's only something you recognize in retrospect. You seem to have like an unusual level of self-awareness for somebody so young. And, and I wonder if that's just the byproduct of the environment that you grew up in uh, and, and why you think more people are not this way. Because I, I think I was talking to somebody yesterday who was interviewing me for, for the podcast about intuition. And he'd asked me, you know, when was the first time you had an intuitive experience? And I thought, you know, I didn't even think about anything like this until I was 30 because I would have written it off as new age bullshit. And my roommate still gives me, you know, shit about it because I always call it all new age bullshit. And he said, Trini, that's literally the work that you do every day with your podcast guests. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think the there is, is something interesting about this because, you know, for most people, it seems to take some sort of crisis or catalyzing event before they start to you know, delve into this sort of self-exploration. But you seem to have had a, a very, very high level of self-awareness at a young age. Um, what do you think is just the byproduct of your, of your environment? Well, I 
think part of it is a byproduct. Definitely a huge part of it is byproduct of the environment. But I also think we just are who we are. And I think a lot of people that are that. But if you also look at it, I mean, I, let me give you actually probably a more honest answer. I mean, I can postulate, but truth is, I have no idea. I just am who I am, you know, so that's the most honest answer. But if we postulate a little bit, if you look at the crises, it's like I went through them from the time I was two years old until, well, until about 19. So it's like I had plenty of crises to uh, to handle and deal with. And I also knew that because I got to a place uh, 20 years ago where I was going to end my life if things didn't change. In fact, I was literally planning to, I planned the date. I knew the how. And um, I had done all the friggin' stuff under the sun and it would work for about three days. And all I was really looking to do was get happy. And then finally I had a session of this stuff called Access Consciousness. And and I literally got happy. But what she did is she gave me some tools to use next time the universe wanted to cave in on my head. Those tools actually worked. So I got happier and happier and happier. But had that not come into my life, I wouldn't be talking to you right now because I was tired of being unhappy, even though I was trying everything under the sun to change it. And so when it's like it, the one of the things is the level of self-awareness you have, if you don't have you don't have a reference point for it that lets you know it's awareness, which is what goes on. You know, our suicide rates across the world are, are just jumping rapidly right now. And my sense is part of that is so many people are so sensitive and so aware of what's going on around them. And they, but what they don't have is, is the level of awareness that allows them to separate themselves from what they're aware of. And so they think it's all theirs. The weight of the world is on their shoulders and they can't see any way out. So I realize it's a very roundabout answer to the question, but it's like we, you know, having, it's like, I am who I am. And I had a lot of stuff at the beginning that made me question life at a very young age, which are things that, you know, shouldn't necessarily, shouldn't be done to a child or delivered to a child. But when they are, what I did was I'm like, I'm going to survive this. I'm going to find some way to survive mentally and physically, which is what I did. Um, so uh, let's talk about this whole idea of, of, you know, access consciousness. First off, what led you down this trajectory? Because it, I think like most people I talk to, um, this isn't a career that you find in a you know high school guidance counselor's office. <laughs> True story. <laughs> uh, it was actually, I am, you know, probably like a lot of your listeners is, you know, I realize now I'm a seeker, somebody who has always looked for different possibilities. And so I tried all the stuff that was out there at the time, including metaphysics, psychology, self-help, business development, anything I thought might, might lead me to a level of happiness. Because from the time I was a little kid, people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd go, happy. And literally, my grandmother asked me this. What do you want to be when you grow up? I said, happy. And she said, no, 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 you don't understand the question. Do you want to be a doctor? Do you want to be an actor? Do you want to be a garbage man? I said, yes, as long as I'm happy. I didn't care what I did. So here I am being a chiropractor, starting my second practice and lower than I've ever been in my life because I thought once I got to be a chiropractor, I'd be able to create the miracles in people's lives I wanted to. That wasn't happening. I was in a relationship where my girlfriend was in judgment of me all the time and I didn't even recognize it. I just knew she didn't seem to like me very much anymore and I couldn't figure out why and we weren't happy together. And I was trying every technique under the sun and I go to weekend workshops and feel like I'd finally found the answer. And then by Wednesday of the following week, it felt like the universe crashed into my head again. And I was as depressed as I was before I went in on Friday. And I went, I'm done. Universe, you got six months. Either my life changes or I'm killing myself. And I don't care which it is. And I thought I was going to get out. I, I had that sweet solace of knowing I'm out of here. So I started getting a little happier at that point. And then I came across this thing called Access Consciousness, I saw this tiny little ad in the paper and it said, Access, all of life comes to me with ease and joy and glory. And I wanted to kill the person that put the ad in the paper. So anyway, I learned that if you hate something or love it, there's something there for you. I called and I had a session of this thing called bars. And it's somebody just puts their hands really lightly on your head. There's 32 points on the head. 
Well, and I was expecting absolutely nothing from this. Okay. And so anyway, she puts her hands on my head and I feel this energy that feels just kind of like being cradled and safe. And I guess I probably hadn't felt safe my whole life, you know? And, um, and I was like, whoa, that's different. And then after a few minutes, as she's moving her hands to different places, I start giggling like a little kid. And I'm like, Gee. <laughs> and I was giggling for the next hour. And I got up from that session after an hour and 15 minutes. I'd gone in depressed and suicidal. And I got up with a sense of gratitude for being alive. And I looked outside at the clouds and was like, has it always been this beautiful here? If it feels this way to be alive, I'm in. And at that moment, I wanted everybody in the world to know this was possible to even feel that way, you know, to, to look out of your eyes and have that experience. And so she, what she did was we traded sessions once a week and each week she would give me a real simple tool to use until the next time we got together. And I would use those tools and where before the universe would cave in on my head two or three days after this amazing experience I would have. When I used these tools, the universe started caving in on my head. I would use the tool and it would go away. And I was like, oh, my God, we not only have a way of getting somebody to this space of what's possible, but actually maintaining it. And then not only that, but going far beyond it into something they may never have even thought was possible before. Hmm. So let's let's talk about this idea of. of you know, consciousness and, you know, something you brought up earlier, which is transforming reality, because you, you, you referenced the phrase, you know, the universe caving in on your head, probably three or four times, maybe more in our conversation. And I think that given the midst of what we're in right now, I don't doubt that many people feel as if the universe is caving in on their heads. So let's talk about one, how we deal with that at sort of a day to day level, but um, also from getting to making it through the day to designing this future with a better reality, which I realize I we can probably talk for 10 hours about this. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. How long do we have? <laughs> well, okay. So one, one of the aspects that I think is essential for people to get is we're really friggin' aware and we're aware of the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the judgments of all kinds of people around us. And nobody's ever told us this. And And the way I like to tell people is, what we found is somewhere around 98% of your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, your judgments, your anxiety, your angst, your fear, your doubt isn't actually yours. You're picking it up like a big psychic sponge, a big psychic radio receiver from the people around you, because we all vibrate like tuning forks, you know, and if you go and study quantum mechanics, you see there's evidence for it there. If you go and study, you know, frequency healing and you see there's evidence for it there, there's evidence for it all kinds of places if we'll look, but most of us haven't ever been exposed to that. So one of the things that can be very helpful initially to, to do is to recognize that. But then there's a tool that we have, which is called, who does this belong to? And so, you know, when you're in the middle of fear or feeling the universe cave on your cave in on your head, because you got 8 billion people on the planet right now doing some form of, ah, you know, and so we're really aware of it, especially at a time like this. And so if you'll just, when it comes up, go, who does this belong to? Who does this belong to? Who does this belong to? And is this mine? And if it lightens up at all, it's not actually yours. You're just aware of it around you. And pointing your attention to it now lets you recognize that it's not yours. Now you don't have to go on that nonstop loop of that monkey mind. I mean, imagine if you could empty out 98% of the crap that was in your head yesterday and only have to deal with the 2% that's left. That 2% is the stuff that's self-generated. And when you only have to work on yourself, quote unquote, you only have to work on 2% of what's left, life gets a lot easier. So that's got to be a beginning point. Well, it doesn't have to be, but it gets easier if that's a beginning point that you can use. And have that awareness and have that tool. Who does this belong to? And is this mine? And just recognize if it lightens up, it's not yours. Just return it to whoever it came from. Because you may not even know that person. It could have been somebody you were driving by or somebody you walked by or somebody who thought of you. You have no idea because we're that linked together. And make sure to tell your roommate that when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what. Where, where should we go from there? 
Well, I, I guess the the thing is like, you know, I, I tend to drill people on titles. I can find a way to tie it to very sort of practical example of, okay, let me change something about my life. And one that I think anybody can relate to is, okay, money, let's, let's go, since we talked about it, well, let's talk about transforming reality when it comes to making more money, you know, because I think that uh, the, the amount of work that I've had to do unwinding all of my issues around money has been, you know, years in the making. And I am shocked at how much damage gets done in terms of what we're taught about all of this. And you just stated it. And by the way, me too. I just want you to know that, you know, there, and it is exactly that. It's based on what we're taught. And so this also goes to that thing I was just saying, 98% of your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Well, 98% of the crap you have around money is not your crap meaning you learned it from somebody else, you bought it as yours, and now you're trying to live that reality as though it's yours. And if there is a surefire recipe for unhappiness and failure, it's trying to live a reality that is not yours. And so part of what we need to do is start to excavate and find out what is our reality. And so if we're talking about money, one thing that could help is write down all the limited points of view you have about money, or actually don't even, don't even qualify it. Just write down all the points of view you have about money. And then next to those points of view, write down who you got it from. And it may be way more than one person. You know, it may be this book, it may be media, it may be mom, maybe dad, maybe blah, 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 blah. And this part, what that is doing is getting you it. Number one, it takes and sorry, uh, I did not explain, but I have ADD, ADHD, OCD and autism all rolled into one. So there are many bright, shiny things that want to be said all at one time. So I apologize for not being able to walk a straight line. Just not something I can do. So having said that, one of the other things that you want to do is you want to unearth the hidden points of view. So, But as you do that, as you start the stream of consciousness, which is delving into your unconsciousness, what will occur is you'll start to get aware when you write down all the points of view you have about money you'll start then getting to the hidden ones that you didn't even realize you had. And you want to write down either where you bought that or what the situation was in just a few words that brought that up. Now, we have this thing called a clearing statement, which from my point of view is the biggest personal development upgrade in the last 200 years. It's a little beyond the scope of what we can probably talk about here. But it's a way of going back to the point of creation and undoing where you bought that point of view. But for this, if you get clearer on the points of view, recognize where you bought them and then go, okay, pock and pod where I bought this is mine and everything I've created and uncreated based on that. And pock just stands for going back to the point of creation of the thoughts, feelings, and emotions at that moment. And the pod stands for the point of destruction, where you took something that was creative and put something less creative or destructive in its place. Just go pock and pod wherever I bought all that is mine. And then what you want to do is you want to go, okay, if I had no past, if every, and if everybody in my life died today, what would I choose regarding money and who would I bring into my bring back into my life tomorrow? And it's a way of getting yourself it's one of the ways of getting yourself to the awareness that what you've been living and what you've been doing with money has been based on a long past with many billions of points of view probably and you can't necessarily go back and change every one of those points of view but by getting the sense of what you would like your future to be what you can do is you can start to recognize where the choices you make to create that future and where the choices you make destroy that future or decay that future. And so if you could ask yourself, okay, if everything, if I had no past, if my entire past were gone as of right now, if nobody were in my life and I could hire anybody back tomorrow that I wanted, what would I choose as my financial future in the next two to five years? And just get a sense of the energy or the, however you sense that. You know, for me, energy is very practical. For other people, it seems a little airy fairy, but everybody who's successful in business has a sense of energy and follows it. So that's the sense I'm trying to use this in. But if you could ask, if I could have anything as my financial future, if I could have anything as my life regarding money in the next two to five years, what would it be? 
And what happens is there's, there's something that comes up. There's either a sense of ease or space or something that feels way different than what today is showing up as. But given that I said two to five years, you can't figure it out logically what specifically that's going to be. So what you have to do then is then you get the energy of that because you can't do it five years in the future without getting the energy of it. And you can't linearize it. So then what you want to do is realize that what anything that is true for you always makes you feel lighter. A lie always makes you feel heavier. And so anything that feels like that energy of lightness that you just asked for, do it. Even if it's a cup of coffee with somebody or going on a trip or starting a relationship or starting a job, whatever it happens to be, that's a way of having something to follow that will lead you to what you're asking for. It's a way of knowing what to choose. And then one other thing, one other element that you want to add in, and this is this is really helpful and also, I would say, really vital, actually, in knowing what to choose that will create the life we actually desire. And it goes beyond all thinking and all that stuff. What you do is you ask, if I choose this, what will my life be like in five years? So if I choose to take this choice, this next step, you know, if we choose to do our marketing this way, what will our lives and what will the, or what will my life and what will the business be like in five years? And if we choose to do it another way, what will it like? And what will it be like? And if we choose not to do it at all, what will it be like? Those will all have a different sense of lightness or expansiveness to them. You want to go for the one that creates the most lightness and expansiveness. And if you start choosing the things in your life that make you light, the sum total of your life will start getting a lot lighter. And lighter is when you're happier. Lighter is when you're more creative. Lighter is when you're actually creating things that are beyond your mind and beyond the the right and wrong judgment system that we've learned to live with. Wow. So there's one other thing that I, I couldn't let go of that you said that really struck, caught my attention was you mentioned, you know, autism, ADHD, and, and all this other stuff they rolled into one. And the autism thing in particular, I think, was what struck me as strange because you're having a conversation with me and I don't think anybody would have ever gathered that if you hadn't said that. Like even, you know, nothing about the way that you're speaking to me uh, indicates that. Uh, so I, I had to ask, you know, about that in a bit more detail. Well, so let's let's look at some of the characteristics that autistics have. They don't have a right brain, left brain function as such, like the rest of the world does. They also have a different sense of time, meaning they don't function from past, present, and future. Also, which is one of the one of the reasons they have such a, a challenge communicating. Not only that, they have an intense level of sensitivity of others which is why they often won't look you in the eyes because there's so much download that they get that it creates a level of discomfort for them. But there are a lot of really high-functioning people who have aspects of the autism scale that are some of the most brilliant creators we have on the planet right now. Now, I'm not saying that to put my myself in the case of the most brilliant creators on the planet it's just in studying this and in looking at the, the where the, I guess that we call it the psychoenergetics of it, and in also working with autistic people, what I've realized is there are a lot of people who have a lot of these capacities and what they get labeled as is disabilities. And so, for example, you know, I've worked with parents with autistic children and, you know, they're having such a difficult time in school. And one of the one of the tools that I've given them, you know, because one of the things that they try to get autistic kids to do is be more linear. And I'm like, that is like trying to take a, you know, a rainbow colored unicorn and make it drab gray. Instead of that, why don't we look at the gift this child is presenting us with a different way of viewing the world and see how we can step up to their way of communicating? that is not as linear, not as limited. And so we worked, um, uh, my friend Gary and I worked with this family who had three autistic kids, if you could imagine, and they were they were like four, seven, and 11. And oh my goodness, they had their work cut out for them. And so one of the things that we suggested they do is instead of trying to plot on a clock each event for the day, which the kids hated and never understood, we said, look, take tomorrow, for example, 
And what we want you to do is play tomorrow like a movie of everything they're going to do that, but it's like a movie that is played instantaneously. And the parents are like, what? We're like, just try it. Okay. And so they didn't understand it, but they went home and with each kid individually, they were like, okay, basically here's tomorrow in an entire movie and everything we're going to do. And it'd be great if you could put on your clothes and eat and do all the stuff that you've been resisting. They came back the next day and they were like, oh my God, we finally found a way to communicate with our kids. We were being too slow. We were trying to make them linear. We didn't realize they're nonlinear. We gave them the whole day and it took about three seconds for each kid. I don't even know how we did it, but our one child who would never eat, not only ate breakfast, but ate at school and ate when she came home because she, and she had this level of peace. Our other child who would never put their clothes on not only put their clothes on, but actually got clean clothes for the first time ever that weren't wrinkled. <laughs> and our other child who used to act up at school was having an easy time because we talked to the teacher and their teacher was the one that would listen about doing this. They're like, this has transformed our whole way of being. And so when I talk about the autistic ADD, ADHD, um, and OCD, what I see those as are actually capacities that we have and I see these people as as the X-Men, the mutation of the species to a higher order of function. And yet everybody's trying, not everybody, but most people are trying to put them in a box so we can make them more normal, as though normal has something wonderful going for it. But I don't know about you, but I think normal sucks. Yeah, I'm with you. Well, um, well, this has been really, really cool and uh, insightful and thought provoking. Um, so I have one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews at Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Choice and an awareness that their contribution is necessary or the world will be missing the gift of the uniqueness they have to offer. Amazing. Well, uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your insights and your wisdom with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you uh, and everything else that you're up to in the world? You can go to drdanehere.com, which is D-R-D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com. And, uh, or you can look me up on YouTube or Facebook. And on YouTube, I've got something like 400 videos now of free tools, free, free stuff, because I want, I'd like to pay this forward. I'd like I'd like as many people in the world as possible to have the awareness that I had after having my bars run for the first time going, it is truly beautiful here. And so that's my, my endeavor to contribute as it were. Amazing. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming. Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. Hello, I'm Shelby Scott, the host of Scare You to Sleep. Scare You to Sleep is a podcast where I tell you scary stories full of creepy sound effects and music that is soothing yet unsettling to help immerse you into a world of horror this is a show for those of us who have realized horror can be a strange but relaxing escape from reality speaking of escapes sometimes i lead you through guided nightmares like a guided meditation but instead of flowery meadows i take you on a journey through your own personal nightmare so come get lost in the terror with me. You can find the show on Acast or wherever you get your podcasts. Sweet screams.